Now, as we enter into chapter 20, chapter 20, the first section has to do with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And the first phase of that is the binding of Satan and casting him in to the bottomless pit. Now, the bottomless pit has been a key recurring theme that we've had all in the book of Revelation. This is not the first time we've had reference to what's called the bottomless pit, which is a compartment of the underworld, Hades, the temporary lodging place for those that will someday face complete annihilation and go into Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. This is Hades, and the bottomless pit is a compartment of Hades. We saw it first in Revelation 9-1. We saw it again in, in Revelation 11-7, chapter 17-8. So this, this is the fourth time we've heard re reference to the bottomless pit. And in this instance, a great angel, now follow me in this, he takes hold of the devil and casts him into the bottomless pit, not the lake of fire yet, into the bottomless pit with a great chain a great chain around him. And he holds, he is held there for a thousand years. That's the real beginning of the millennial kingdom. You see, the last time when we finished up in chapter 19, we saw Jesus victorious with his armies, casting the Antichrist and the false prophet alive into the lake of fire. And the Bible goes on to say that the rest of the enemies were slain. That's probably a good reference to the Matthew 25 sheep and goat judgments that will take place from Jerusalem. So that having been done, now we're ready to start the next great chapter of the last days here on the earth. The thousand years reign of Jesus Christ from his throne of David in Jerusalem. The Bible says in verse 4, that John sees the thrones and them that, that were seated upon them, and judgment was given to them. He sees the souls of them which had been beheaded for Christ during this tribulation period and had not taken the mark. And it says they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now that's not 850 years or 320 years or some symbolic notation. The Bible says a thousand years, we believe to be a thousand years. And this, mind you, again, to repeat, this is after the evil one has been muffled, silenced, imprisoned, a seal put on his captivity. That's it for him. He's not destroyed yet. The Bible says after that thousand years, he's going to be loosed for just a little season, just a short time. And then that's it for him. But assume during this portion of our lesson, the devil is bound for a thousand years, which means there's no temptation, there's no sin, there's no killing, there's no disease. We're set to enjoy this earth under the kingship of Jesus Christ, the great stone kingdom that Daniel the prophet referred to in the second chapter of his book. These people here that John is seeing, the souls of them which had been beheaded for Christ, martyrs, Reminds me of the scripture in Hebrews 11.25 where Paul was talking about all the different great witnesses. And he was talking about Moses. And he said, Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. And Moses returned to his roots and suffered. But look at the reward that he has. During these last days, during the, the tribulation period, there's going to be so much temptation to fleshly desires, fleshly lusts. And these people that John are seeing, John's seeing here as special martyrs, they chose, they chose the narrow route. They chose to be martyred. They chose to sacrifice their lives. Those who sacrifice their lives unto death will receive the crown of life in all eternity. And so we have a glimpse of those here as this chapter opens. Second Timothy 2.12 reminds us, if ye suffer with Christ, ye shall also reign with Christ. These here that we see are set up to be kings and priests with Christ for a thousand years. Leaders. Revelation 1.6, Revelation 5.10 says, he hath made us kings and priests. Kings and priests. 
to serve at his good pleasure in the earth for a thousand years, doing his bidding. Everybody in this room is going to have responsibilities and do things. You're not going to just be sitting around playing a harp all day long. Oh yeah, there'll be great times of fellowship and praise and good times and all that, but there will be a functioning government with King Jesus at the head. These people here that we're seeing uh, that, are, that are shown on thrones, Matthew 19, 28, gave it, Jesus gave us a glimpse of that. Jesus said, you, ha- you who have been faithful with me shall sit upon 12 thrones alongside my throne in glory, leading the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel's going to be involved. There's going to be priests, leaders with thrones governing those 12 tribes in special ways that are not particularly articulated except to say that they will be doing this. The other special class, as we mentioned, is the martyrs of the tribulation period. Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life, as we just mentioned. These and the other faithful multitudes will inherit the earth during the thousand years millennial rule of Christ from Jerusalem. This is, if you recall, when we were studying in Daniel, Daniel's chapter 2, verse 44, this is the great stone kingdom that obliterated all the other kingdoms that were going forward from Daniel's days. He was living in the time of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians. David came along and overthrew the Babylonians. And then came the Greeks. And then came the Romans. And then the Roman Empire divided in about, about 464. And the Bible prophesied that there would be a last days kingdom of ten nations that will make up the last days government. And then Daniel saw this big huge stone cut out of the side of a mountain and smash those other kingdoms. And Daniel says in Daniel 2.44, the great stone kingdom, an everlasting kingdom that fadeth not away. All these other kingdoms, brothers and sisters, fell away. They fell away. They were defeated by other kingdoms. And in just about all of them, there was emperor worship. The Greeks made their their leaders gods. So did the Romans. So did the Egyptians. And Nebuchadnezzar tried it also in Babylon. But Daniel's pointing out here that this this kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is never going to fade away, ever. After the thousand years, we go into eternity. That's a whole different, that's a whole different ballgame. So that's why all of this is so very important, not only for us in our walk and in our witness to others, but to those who might be marginal and who might be living a little bit carelessly now, but who have a sense that something foreboding is coming. And it's all here in this book of Revelation and the solution for every one of us and for every one of them that are searching is to partake freely of the water of life, which is Jesus Christ, trusting in him to cleanse our sins, to wash them white as snow, though they be as scarlet, they'll be washed white as snow. And that formula is never going to change. It's always going to be that. There's not going to be some new twist to Christianity. The true gospel will always be Receive Jesus into your heart and be reconciled to God through his son, Jesus Christ. We have some descriptions very briefly about the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 9, 17, Jeremiah 17, 25, the throne of David from which the Lord shall rule. Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem. Matthew 25, 31, Christ shall reign from his throne of glory in Jerusalem. All of the Beatitudes, remember, we've, we've always studied the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are ye when men shall revile and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. There are all of these beatitudes are fulfilled during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the eternal kingdom of God. Ezekiel 43 gives us a glimpse into the, the glory of the millennial temple 
described by the prophet. Ezekiel 48, 31 describes the gates of the millennial Jerusalem. Isaiah eleven six says the lamb will lay down with the wolf. That's a perfect symbol of what it's going to be like during the millennial time here in the earth. Things that are not normal today will be normal then. The wolf and the lion. Peace everywhere. Isaiah eleven six, as I said, says the lamb and the lion will lay down together along with the wolf. Zechariah fourteen sixteen. Each year all citizens will go up to Jerusalem and give homage to King Jesus. That's the way it will be for a thousand years. And the Bible says in verse five, the rest of the dead live not again until the end of the thousand years. The souls mentioned in verse 4 belong to the first resurrection. That is to say, those that are in the earth, those that have been, that are ruling in the earth as kings and priests, they've already passed, as we said in that first chapter from, from John, they've already passed from death back to life. That's the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Verse 6 says this, Blessed is he that hath part in the first resurrection on who the second death has no power. And then the Bible says in verse 7 through 10, at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be loosed for a short season. So assume a thousand years, and at the end of the thousand years, the devil is loosed from his prison for a, for a short time. The Bible says he goes forward he doesn't even remotely hint at repentance or trying to make amends with anybody. He goes straight out and begins to tempt and solicit rebellion to all the people that are on the earth. And some will listen to him and some will succumb. The Bible says as the sands. There's going to be many people who for a thousand years have never tasted real temptation and then old scratch is going to come along in some way, form, and tempt them. And there's going to be rebellion. And there's going to be a, an attack and a surrounding and an encirclement of the holy city Jerusalem. Not the final new Jerusalem. That's, that's after all of this is done. But the armies of the rebellions are going to encircle Jerusalem. Gog and Magog is the name that's used again. Also in conjunction with Ezekiel 38, the last day's battle as a precursor to Armageddon when, the, when Gog and Magog nations will come down and try to surround Israel and destroy her. That's separate from this in, invasion, but John uses the same analogy, Gog and Magog, probably some of the same countries, but the analogy is the enemies, those who have become enemies as with the original fall, when Satan solicited some of the angels to rebel with him, he's going to solicit some of the people in the world to rebel and try to lay claim to planet Earth. And many will follow him. And the Bible says that fire will come down and destroy them all. No more battles. No more rising and falling of kingdoms. No more interim periods. God's going to send fire down from heaven and destroy all those that try and overthrow the government of King Jesus in the last day, in the last time of the millennial period, and that is that. Fire comes down and destroys them. And then in verse 10, if we could see that slide, please. Verse 10, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. I believe we're a little bit ahead of ourselves up there. Yeah, yeah. Satan is cast into the lake of fire forever to be tortured for all eternity. You know, there's an interesting scripture in Isaiah 14, 12 to 16. The Bible says that as the devil is cast into the lake of fire, many will behold him. The Bible says, thou shalt be brought low, brought down low to the sides of the pits of hell. Those who behold thee shall look narrowly upon thee, saying, is this he who conquered kings and nations? That's the eternal destiny of our enemy. He is going to be completely 100% 
helpless. He will spend all eternity, day and night, tormented forever and forever in the lake of fire. And we can only imagine those horrors. But over above all, he's never going to be heard from again. As the Bible says, the former things shall be removed and never again come to mind. The, the devil and Lucifer will be a concept once we enter into the new Jerusalem that, that will never be a subject again. The Bible says a little bit further, there will in no wise enter any form of abomination ever. Man's been on probation all these 6,000 years. And when God brings things to a close and the devil is destroyed, that's it. Think about that. That's, that's, that's an incredible journey to want to be on. Verses 11 through 15 here in this 20th chapter, we see the great white throne judgment. We see the books opened. We see every, every soul that's ever rejected the Lord being judged according to their works. And the Bible says the books were opened. The books were opened. Now, what does that mean to you? I'll tell you what it means. It means when the lost souls stand before God, there's going to be an amazing videography. My daughter and her husband do a really good job doing weddings now. And they've gotten very good at it. And they, they keep things. They, they keep recordings and they pull them out and they store them and they bring up little glimpses and little snippets and so forth. And when the lost stand before God at the great white throne judgment, every time they had a relative or an aunt or an uncle or a grandfather, grandmother, sister, brother, teacher, that says, Joe, Phil, William, Sue, Mary, won't you, won't you sit down and let us read a few passages from the Bible? No, no, I, I, I don't want that. Don't want it. Don't need it. Don't want it. Every time those deeds, those, those scenes are going to be played back. That's what the scripture here means when it says the books were opened. The life, a review of the life, and mainly every time they had to turn and receive Jesus and they refused. They didn't want it. That's going to be played back to them. It's a very, very sad scene. The Bible says, and another book was opened, which was the book of life in that scene. And there'll be the man or the woman that's being judged there based upon their life from the 5th century, from the 3rd century, the antediluvians, all the way back to the days of Noah, all the way back up to the 21st century, whenever it happens, however much further along before the last human being comes in and goes. Every single human being that's ever lived who has not found the grace of God will be cast into this lake of fire. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 14, has something interesting to say exactly along these lines. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. It's all going to come out. It's all going to come out. You can't hide from God, no matter what you do or how hard you try. Jesus said in, 10, in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not him who can destroy the body, but fear him indeed who can cast both body and soul into hell. There's several different ways you can interpret that particular scripture, but it means... If you are faced with your life and somebody has a sword or a spear or a gun to take your life, you don't have to be afraid of them. But he who can cast both your body and your soul into hell, you better have a reverential fear for them. Because that's God. God can do that. And so, the, so Jesus was saying here, take, take heed. Revelation 20, 12 to 15, the Lamb's book of life was opened. Whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And one of the saddest things about a relative, about losing a relative forever, is that they'll be forgotten. Isaiah 65, 17, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. The former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. That's very, very sad. 
It doesn't have to be that way, though. We still have time. We still have time. We have a half an hour here tonight. We have time. The trumpet hasn't sounded yet. The church here at Overland Park has, has, a, has a very aggressive and enthusiastic missions campaign underway to reach the lost in different cultures, different lands. The gospel is going out all around the world today. There's time. People don't have to go to the great white throne judgment. And Peter he says, the Lord is ever mindful of us, ever mindful to usward. King James says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus wants everybody to repent, everybody to be saved, and it's not too late. And you may do like I do sometimes. You may bash your head against the wall and say, how do I get through to this person, Lord? How do I keep praying? Keep praying. Keep praying. God knows your heart. God knows God knows how to bring people into life situations where they cry out and they say, like the jailer did, boy, what do I need to do to get right with God? There's that still voice that says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Your house, it's not too late. The Bible says in closing in this 20th chapter, death is the last enemy to be destroyed. So as we go into chapter 21, we see the devil has been destroyed the great white throne judgment has taken place. All of the devil's angels and all of the wicked have been cast into the lake of fire where they will be forever and ever. Don't ever let anyone try and convince you that there's not a hell. There is a hell. It's very real. Remember the parable of Lazarus and the rich man that Jesus gave us where it's a place of agony and there's a place of separation and it's never going to change. It's never going to end. But again, it doesn't have to be that way if people will repent. And all through this book of Revelation, even during the tribulation period, the angelic overtones to the world don't take the mark of the beast. Repent, repent, repent. Just like John the Baptist said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And even so, most will not, but some will. And the point is that the gospel message will always be there until those vile judgments start coming out. And even during the abomination of desolation, people will be able to choose not to take the mark of the beast. And now that the scene changes again. We enter into chapter 21. And it's all bliss from here on out. All bliss, the enemy destroyed. Everyone's eternal destiny sealed. I love the way this chapter starts out. John says, I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the former heaven and former earth are passed away, and there was no more sea. And John sees the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem, that's heaven. That's the eternal city of God. People ask me frequently about heaven. Paradise comes first. Paradise is where most of the sequences that we've seen in this Revelation book have taken place and been staged amidst the, the, the elders and the sea, the tranquil sea, and the four strange-looking beasts and all of the saints under the altar and around the altar cheerleading, that's paradise. There's a tabernacle there too with altars and incense. It's in, the, it's in the supernatural, it's in the heavenlies, but it's not the new Jerusalem. Here in chapter 21, this is the new Jerusalem. This is heaven. And John's about to escort us through that. What class. You know, not only do we serve a holy and a majestic God, we serve a classy God. Streets of gold, clears, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Boy, you, when, you, when you do business with God, he's first class. And you're going to see a little taste of that right now. John sees the new Jerusalem, as I said, coming down as a bride. John saw it coming down. 
Imagine that, Ted. Imagine seeing heaven coming down. He saw it. And he wrote about it. Verse 6, I am, he hears this voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now why did he say that right there? At this precise juncture. Because he wants everybody to know what your ticket is to New Jerusalem. How do you get in? And Jesus said, I'll, I'll give anybody, anybody that wants the water of life freely, freely. Right here in the close of Revelation, as he's about to take you through New Jerusalem, he's talking, being born again, just like he did to the woman of the well and many others, the new life, Zacchaeus, all the disciples. The new life, the water of life. I am Alpha and Omega, I will give unto them that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. And then verse 7 in chapter 21, which is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. John hears a voice. And the voice says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. <coughs> Excuse me. Heaven's going to be filled with overcomers overcomers that had besetting sins and crud in their life, sins even after they were converted. But the, the, the Word of God has so many helping places to overcome. And so many scriptures to bind you up. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God unto the pulling down of Satan's stronghold and bringing every thought into captivity and obedience to Jesus Christ. So many others about the ability to overcome. The Lord will never allow us to be tempted beyond that which we can handle. And with the temptation, he will also provide a means of escape. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of unrighteousness. We are surrounded by tools to help us overcome. And so often, that mode of escape involves using one word, and that word is no. Whether it be something you shouldn't be watching on the screens, or whether it's a type of literature that you're dabbling with, whatever it is that keeps you from having the intimacy, there are many means in the Bible to help us overcome them. And this scripture here says, He that overcometh, overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the fearful and abominable shall burn forever in the lake of fire, which is the second death. And now we see this great new Jerusalem coming down, having great high walls and with 12 gates, with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, north, south, east, east and west. There's been a lot of discussion about the city. Is it cubed? Is it triangulated? Is it pyramid shaped? Well, the Bible says it's pretty clear. It's cubed, four square. That settles it for me. Approximately 15 miles, or excuse me, 1,500 miles in each direction. Streets of pure gold. That's a big place. 1,500 miles each direction. It's going to be big. It'll be a billion people or more. Who knows? A lot of people there. A lot of angels. Of course, the Lord right in the middle of it. The city was made of pure gold, clear as glass. Foundations all made of precious stones. No temple for the Lord God shall walk therein. No need for the sun or moon for the Lord shall give them light. God's glory lightens the great city. The nations will walk in the glory, the gates not shut by day or night, for there shall be no night there, and no form of abomination shall ever enter into the new Jerusalem. What a place. How thankful we should be. How thankful we are to have a glimpse of heaven. Just incredible beauty, the sublimity, the holiness, forever, the new Jerusalem. That's our goal. 
There's so much more we could say. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the closing chapter of the Bible to you as a fitting conclusion. We've taught Revelation in about eight different churches before. We've never done it this way, but we're going to do it here. It only takes about three minutes. So I'm reading the 22nd chapter of this incredible book for you. This is John speaking. And the angel showed me a pure river of water of life, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, which is Jesus, as you know, in the midst of the tree of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every one each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light nor sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had seen and heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, uh, See that you do it not, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of them which have the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and the morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy, of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth to these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That's how this book ends. Just a couple of quick notes in these last passages in chapter 22. 
you notice that he refers to the, the tree of life. The tree of life goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There were two, two main trees in the, in the Garden of Eden. There was the tree of knowledge. And there was the tree of life. When Adam and Eve fell, they were punished. And God set a protection and said, you know, if we don't put a barrier here, they might eat of the free tree of life unworthily and thereby sneak in and live forever. So that's not going to happen. And God set an angelic, a flaming angel with a firing flame to protect against that happening. But man violated in the beginning. He did partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And ever since that day, death and sin has been part of man's probation, integral part of it. Today we see the unbridled, the uninhibited tree of life in the new Jerusalem that you will eat freely of. There'll be, there'll be fruits in the seasons. Personally, I think those fruits not only will be delicious, but they'll be there to provide us with a very subtle reminder that we are created beings and that we will always need our God to provide us. Even though there's no need for light or sunshine or moonlight, just the, the, sustaining ourselves through all eternity through the fruit of the tree of life. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's the book of Revelation. Look back on your journey here. Look back when you first started this book. A lot of you were unsure of yourselves, not sure where this was going, trepidations, fright, uncertainty, symbols. What we've tried to do is usher you through here and show you that these symbols are not just a bunch of spooks and not a bunch of scary monsters. They have meaning. They're tied into the scripture. They're tied into God's plan to bring about his reclaiming of this planet from the enemy and to usher in righteousness. And all of us have gone through a part of our lives where we've heard well-meaning believers, we hear it a lot even today, for whatever reason, they put aside this study. They just don't want to go into the waters. It's too this, it's too that, it's too this, it's too that, it's too difficult. It's, there's too many different interpretations. I don't understand it. Jesus is going to come whenever he comes, and I just want to be ready. Okay, 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 okay. It's not my place to judge anybody. But what you can see is that by, by reading and studying this book on your own, promises of, of great blessing come to you 